Okay, so we are all set. And uh, uh, today we have Luca DeFeo from uh, IBM Research to give us this interesting talk. Uh, Luca received his PhD from Echo Poly, uh, Polytechnic uh, in 2010 with a thesis on computer algebra and the computational number theory. And then he joined the University of uh, Versailles uh, in 2011 as an assistant professor. And then he kept working on computer algebra and cryptography. He is currently employed at IBM Research uh, where he works on post-quantum cryptography and the related topics. So if you are in the crypto community, you probably already know Luca and uh, uh, his pirates, uh, uh, pirates of uh, seaside. <laughs> but that's, that's a really interesting uh, talk. And today his talk is on this insecurity of El Gamo uh, in open PGP. And uh, I will pass the stage to Luca. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, be here and speak on our work. Um, so as you can read, this is joint work with uh, Bertrand Pöttering and uh, Alessandro Sorniotti, um, both at IBM Research with me. And it was presented at uh, ACM CCS uh, a few months back. Unfortunately, you won't see any pirates in this video because pirates only do isogenies. Okay, so let's get started. This is about uh, El Gamal, which is uh, a very classic um, encryption system, public key encryption system, uh, and the way it's used in uh, OpenPGP, uh, the uh, mail encryption standard. So the encryption standard, and that's mostly known for encrypting uh, emails. So the one slide uh, summary of our work uh, could be this one. Um, it's that details matter, especially when you are writing a specification. So for example, when you write the specification of how to hang a picture, um, first thing you while you're writing the application is take a hammer. And second thing is going to be strike the nail. And of course, there is a dangerous ambiguity here in what is meant by nail, which may lead to some injuries. And uh, you will see that there is an ambiguity in the way uh, OpenPGP defines El Gamal that leads to serious injuries for a few um, users of the OpenPGP ecosystem. Um, so let's just uh, take a, a thousand mile overview and let's reflect a little bit on what can possibly be uh, a problem in a cryptographic standard. Um, so first of all, of course, um, the, the standard could be broken from a theoretical point of view. You could specify a protocol which uh, is made of uh, components which are individually safe. Uh, you use uh, discrete logarithm, RSA assumption, you use signatures, you use encryption, but then when you put the pieces together, then there is a break. Um, we are very uh, used to see this kind of uh, theoretical breaks in cryptography because uh, when you have complex protocols such as TLS, um, which don't have formal proofs of security, um, the details really matter. And uh, there may be a, um, a hole in the, in the whole protocol that uh, despite all the security of the individual components doesn't afford security to, to the whole protocol. Um, these are, can be very hard to catch, uh, especially if the protocol is complex, uh, but there's lots of people working on those and uh, hopefully uh, with time they got, uh, they got uh, uh, caught. Second problem that may, uh, there may be uh, with the specification is that the specification in itself is uh, safe, but the implementations may leak uh, information through side channels. Um, this is a whole area of research. And of course, um, you probably know that it is very difficult to protect against all kinds of side channel leakage. Um, so depending on your uh, threat model, you need to account for these possibilities and be careful how you uh, code things. And um, this is something that usually, um, like there's lots of people uh, staring at code and uh, looking for side channel conditions and trying to exploit them. 
And even when you think you've protected at least all of those, uh, a new side channel comes up, uh, comes up and uh, then you need to patch. And it seems to be a never ending cycle. But hopefully the more time passes, the more you can hope these things to be secure against the um, most dangerous side channels uh, so that the attack windows gets smaller and smaller. Um, another things that may happen and which uh, uh, is annoying, but it's very, it's usually caught very early in, uh, in the stages of uh, using a standard is when there is no theoretical problem, your implementation are reasonably protected against side channel attacks. Um, when you use them in isolation, your implementations are perfectly fine. So you can have your wonderful email encryption program, uh, encrypt emails to some other person who's using the same wonderful encryption program, and there is no problem. But then the problem happens when um, the two different implementations of the same standard do not interoperate. Um, how can this happen? Well, this can happen if the standard is not precise enough. If there are some details missing in the standard that make um, that leave some freedom to interpretation, uh, that in the end causes two different implementations of the standard to have incompatibilities. Um, this is something that's actually the case in OpenPGP, which we're going to talk about uh, in, a few, uh, uh, in a few slides, because uh, the OpenPGP standard is quite broad, as you will see, and uh, not all implementations of OpenPGP of open implement the whole standard. So in a sense, they are not fully inter interoperable. Um, but at least on the parts where they do interoperate, they interoperate without bugs. So um, usually this is something that you catch pretty fast because, well, you will see uh, error messages if things don't inter interoperate. Of course, it can take a lot of work to catch all of these problems. But much more sneaky is the problem we're going to talk about today, which is the case where the implementation are secure in isolation. In isolation. Um, my email encryption program is perfectly fine. Uh, I've inspected all of the code, it looks perfectly fine. There's even some uh, uh, formal proofs that tell me that at least some pieces of my program and, and my protocol are perfectly fine. Um, it, interoper it interoperates very well with any other program that respects the standard. The problem is, and this is very hard to catch, that the standard is not precise enough and is leaving uh, some uh, wiggle room for uh, interpretation of how the protocols, how the algorithms should be implemented. And in this uh, freedom of choice, um, there may be some uh, insecurity that's hiding uh, in plain sight. And now these are, very, these are very hard to catch because you cannot just see them by looking at the standard. Um, unless you notice that the standard is not precise enough, you won't, know, you won't notice the problem in the standard itself because the problem is not in the standard. The problem is in the way that the standard is implemented. Um, and it's very hard to notice by looking at the every, any single implementation, because uh, if you look at your program, it's perfectly fine. If you look at, a, at another program, it's also perfectly fine. It's only when these two interoperate that they made choices that uh, lead to uh, attacks. And this is precisely the kind of scenario we're going to um, show has happened in uh, OpenPGP. So uh, OpenPGP. Uh, what is OpenPGP? You probably have already heard of this. PGP stands for pretty good uh, privacy. And uh, this is an open standard that it's in IETF standard since 1998. Um, that's the uh, hair of uh, the original PGP program written by uh, Phil Zimmerman. Um, it's essentially a, a cryptographic toolbox with uh, lots of algorithms. Uh, the main goal is to uh, do uh, encryption of files or emails. Um, the most popular use for uh, OpenPGP is of course end-to-end -end email encryption. Uh, it is indeed one of the two uh, popular standards for end-to-end uh, -end email encryption along with s um, Being a popular email encryption standard doesn't mean that it's a popular standard because not many people do encrypt emails, at least not end-to-end. -end. Of course, the transport is encrypted, but uh, they're not end-to-end -end encrypted. And of course, there's a lot of debate on uh, how hard to use uh, OpenPGP is and how this has held back email encryption. And then you can have lots of criticism on uh, just the simple idea of encrypting email, how it's not 
um, going to be uh, forward secure. And so it's, it's difficult to implement properly. One should switch to secure messaging signal, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is not a debate we're going to have today. But at least for those who like me and who like other people in this room, maybe, uh, encrypt emails, um, OpenBGP is a very familiar tool, which uh, you may be using every day. The main implementation of the OpenPGP standard, uh, the most uh, popular one is uh, without doubt uh, GPG, the GNU Privacy Guard, um, which is a C implementation of the uh, OpenPGP standard, um, a pretty broad one. It's nearly the reference implementation for the OpenPGP standard, I would say. Uh, other important implementations are Boton, which is uh, since uh, recently used by Thunderbird, Mozilla Thunderbird, the uh, email program. Uh, Go, which is uh, used in, uh, by ProtonMail, one popular uh, encrypted email um, service, which is based on, uh, on OpenPGP. Uh, Leap Crypto Plus Plus, another popular, especially for research, uh, cryptographic library. Um, there's many others. Um, and of course, OpenPGP is specified in, uh, in RFCs. Um, the main RFC is the 4880, which uh, is called the OpenPGP message format and which essentially contains almost everything about how OpenPGP is laid out. Um, other extensions to uh, this are the uh, RFC 3156, which specifies the um, how to use OpenPGP for email, essentially. And then uh, two extensions about cryptography, one which has the uh, Camellia uh, symmetric cipher and one which adds a little curve cryptography to OpenPGP you may notice that there is not really a, an RFC in this list that talks about cryptography in OpenPGP. Um, at least there's none that says how to use RSA or how to use Algamap. So all the information on how you do, should implement cryptography, um, if you exclude Camellia analytic curves, which have their own RFC, all the rest, um, you, just, you must go and find it into the uh, OpenPGP message format RFC which as we will see, it's fairly incomplete. So what algorithms, what cryptographic algorithms does OpenPGP support? Um, it supports hash functions, um, some old ones such as MD5 and some more up-to-date ones, SHA-1 and mostly SHA-2. Um, symmetric ciphers, um, um, AES, certainly the most used one, but you can use triple this if, you, uh, if you're daring. Uh, Camellia, this uh, recently uh, added one. Um, for public key encryption, it supports RSA, Elgamal, and uh, Elliptic Curve Diffie-Hellman uh, turned into an encryption protocol. Um, and for signature, it uses RSA, DSA, and ECDSA, the Elliptic Curve uh, DSA. Um, so these are the things that the standard says um, are supported by the message format for OpenPGP. So the message format uh, has a special field where you can say this packet is signed with DSA, for example. And there are no other symbols. There's, there are, of course, uh, reserved symbols for future use. So you, you may imagine in the future adding more algorithms, uh, the same way that is ad has happened for LT curves, which are, were added after RFC 4880. Uh, but yeah, for the moment, at the present date, these are the algorithms uh, that are supported by the message format. And so one uh, interesting bit of information is if you go uh, read into RFC 4880, which is already 15 years old nearly, uh, it says that um, the only compulsory algorithms to implement uh, as far as public key crypto is, uh, is uh, concerned are DSA for signatures and LGAMAL for encryption. And it's also recommended to implement RSA. Now, I think all the implementations of OpenPGP implement RSA, of course. Um, most implement, uh, and all also implement DSA. Most implement Algamal uh, completely, as we will see. Um, as I already said, one uh, common complaint against OpenPGP is, is that it does not provide forward secrecy. Uh, this can only be partially blamed on OpenPGP. This is not something you can easily achieve with emails without a change to the uh, email uh, protocol itself. Um, so um, this is certainly not uh, a concern for us. We will focus on public key encryption and signature. And now 
our work only focuses on the public key uh, part of OpenPGP. So we will uh, just look at what uh, public key algorithms uh, are present in the OpenPGP specification and uh, how they are specified. So RSA, uh, essentially the specifications, uh, the specification uh, sends to PKCS1, uh, which is the standard RSA uh, specification published by the RSA uh, company. Um, for elliptic curves, uh, it sends to uh, the RFC 6637, which contains all the details on elliptic curves. And within that RFC, it specifically refers to uh, FIPS uh, 186.3 for ECDSA and to the NIST Special Publication 856A for elliptic curve DFL1. Um, so uh, these are things that you can find specified pretty much in detail uh, without, uh, without any doubts. And for DSA, of course, it's, uh, it sends to the standard specification of DSA, the, the only official one, which is the FIPS 186.2. But for Algamal, and this is the interesting bit, well, for Algamal, it turns that no one else has specified uh, the Algamal encryption, uh, public key encryption scheme. Um, so, um, RFC 4880 must uh, refer to some, um, to some text. And the only text that uh, are referenced within are El Gamal's original paper uh, in 85 and the Handbook of Applied Cryptography, uh, which was published in 97, about the time when um, OpenPGP, uh, sorry, when GPG was being written. And so also when uh, the OpenPGP standard was being initiated. So these are kind of, old uh, publications, uh, which do not account for all the uh, things that have been said on uh, El Gamal, in a sense. Um, let's look at how they define El Gamal. So these are ex excerpts from the two publications. On the left, you have the Handbook of Applied Cryptography, and on the right, you have El Gamal's original paper. And now if we look at the um, uh, marked uh, parts, uh, we can see that there are pretty much consistent in what they say. They both say you should choose a large random prime P. Um, now it's not clear what random means here, and we will see this is very important. Neither of the two texts says how you should generate P. Um, it's totally possible that uh, the uh, Handbook of Applied Cryptography has a chapter somewhere else on how to generate primes for, for Diffie-Hellman, and you could want to apply that. I honestly haven't gone through all the handbook. But if you only look at the section on El Gamal, it's really not clear how you should generate this large random prime. Um, and then they both say that you should choose a generator alpha of uh, the multiplicative group uh, of Z mod P, of the integers mod P. Uh, primitive element means the same thing as generator of the multiplicative group. So they are consistent on this. Um, and then the handbook of applied cryptography tells you that your secret key he, they denote it by A, should be uh, between one and P minus two, uh, extremes included. Um, El Gamal is much more uh, vague on this. It just says there is a secret key. Okay, um, let's uh, trust the handbook. And then when you look at the encryption part, so the, the, the boxes below, you will see that El Gamal reminds uh, the reader that P should be chosen so that P minus one has at least large, one large prime factor which is very important. You cannot have security if you don't have this. And this is something that is not mentioned at all in the uh, specification, well, in the chapter on El Gamal inside the, the Handbook of Applied Cryptography. So we really need a special algorithm to generate these primes. And then it says that the ephemeral key called K, I will come back on uh, again on, the, on this ephemeral key and how you do things, how you define El Gamal. But so this ephemeral key K, should be uniformly selected between zero and P minus one. It's unclear whether the extremes are included or not in this interval. If you look at the handbook of elliptic curve cryptography, they are definitely not included because it says K uh, greater or equal than one and smaller or equal than P minus two. Shouldn't be much of a difference. It shouldn't be very important whether you take or not the extremes. Uh, shouldn't, it should still be okay. Um, it's, uh, it's not a big deal. They seem to be uh, fairly consistent, except that we don't really know how to generate this large random prime such that P minus one has at least one large prime factor. And this is of course very important because uh, depending on how you do, you will get different security properties. Um, so now if we look at what happens in the wild, 
this is what we did. We went uh, fishing for uh, implementations of OpenPGP and we looked at what they really uh, did. Um, so for the large prime P, we observe a lot of uh, variations. We see safe primes, we see Schnorr uh, primes. I will define what I mean by this. We see Limli primes. Uh, again, I will define what I mean by this. We see even other things, which honestly, we're not entirely sure how they were selected um, because um, you will see now that um, in some cases, we, 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 we don't have the source code. And so we just infer from looking at the primes how they were generated. And so we don't have full information on how this thing was done. Um, as for the generator alpha, uh, both El Gamal and uh, the handbook said that it should be a primitive element. Uh, but one very standard choice is instead of uh, generating the whole multiplicative group is to generate just the subgroup of large prime holder. Um, and some libraries do this. Uh, this is especially reasonable to do in combination with a safe prime. So we will see that um, this, is, um, um, this is a very important uh, subtlety that will lead or not to, uh, to attacks. Um, and then aside from this uh, key generation, there is also the issue of how you, you sample the private key and the ephemeral key in the, uh, in in the key generation and the, uh, in the encryption parts of the protocol. Um, both the handbook and El Gamal said the sample them from a large interval, uh, somewhere between zero and P minus one, extremes included, not included, things vary. Um, but uh, another common optimization, which is done mostly for efficiency, is to sample these keys from short intervals, um, much shorter than uh, the, much smaller than the interval zero to P minus one. Um, while this is in principle a safe choice, if things are done properly, we will see that this is crucial for our attacks. This can lead to attacks in some cases. Um, so now you see there, there is all this uh, variety of choices and the natural question is what could possibly go wrong? If we have all these implementations that implement the open PGP standard in different ways, uh, some of these ways not even following what the, the RFC uh, is saying, assuming that the RFC is really saying go and read uh, the handbook of applied cryptography. Um, well, what's the worst that can happen? Uh, a nice metaphor, which probably some of you have already seen, is the story of the Mars Climate Orbiter. Um, if you remember this mission uh, that was launched back in the 90s, I believe, was to send a satellite to, to gather um, data, uh, atmospheric data from, uh, from Mars. And um, so this was launched by NASA. Um, and upon approaching Mars, um, uh, upon passing uh, behind Mars, so while it was going behind Mars and it couldn't be seen from Earth, um, the, uh, this satellite just crashed or went out of orbit and was lost in space. We don't really know. Um, and so the mission was just lost. Um, when uh, the post-mortem was done, people realized that the cause for this uh, mistake was that um, Lockheed Martin, a subcontractor of NASA, had provided code that was giving uh, results in imperial units. So in a pound force uh, per a second, something like that, um, times seconds while the NASA software was expecting uh, units in, uh, in the metric system, so uh, Newton's seconds. Um, and of course, there is a conversion factor between two, which is rather large. And this le led to the thrusters of the satellite not being activated at the right times. And so putting the satellite essentially out of orbit, out of its planet orbit, and entering Mars atmosphere at a much lower orbit, which probably destroyed the satellite or maybe bounced off and was lost in space. Um, so you see, this is the kind of fails that we may expect uh, for El Gamal uh, when the standard is not precise on uh, what the parameters should be like. In our case, um, we have all these different choices for the primes and for the, pri for the generator of the, of the group. Um, maybe there are some instances in which combining these choices will lead to, to some security disaster. So um, in a nutshell, what are our results? Um, we analyzed a few open source libraries 
namely uh, GPG Boton Lib Crypto Plus uh, Plus, we we found out that they all implement Al Gamal in a different way. Uh, neither none of these ways is compatible with what is written in the handbook of uh, the applied cryptography. Um, each of these implementation is perfectly fine if taken in isolation. A GPG software encrypting emails to another GPG software, that's perfectly safe. We also found that when these libraries interoperate, they interoperate properly and safely. So if I take GPG, I encrypt a message to a key that was generated by Button, everything goes fine. No, no security problem, interoperability um, works. I can decrypt and, and the message is secure. But, uh, sorry, we also looked at another, uh, before the but, we also looked at another library, which is Go, which in the standard library implements Al Gamal, uh, used to implement Al Gamal, it's now deprecated. Um, but Go is really the least offender because it doesn't even implement key generation. So it doesn't uh, respect the open PGP specification. It only implements encryption and decryption. So, and it does so in a way that's totally safe. So Go is really not a concern here. Uh, we will essentially forget about Go. Uh, the problems are really in the other uh, libraries. Um, so, so far I said everything is fine and uh, no problem, but we also uh, figured that GPG, Boton and Libre Crypto++ Plus Plus were making some potentially dangerous choices in the way that the, crypt the uh, encryption routine the El Gamal encryption routine was implemented. Um, specifically, we figured that for some specific uh, El Gamal keys generated by algorithms which are uh, conceivable in principle, although they were not used by neither of these libraries, uh, we figured that uh, there could be a security problem. So we went uh, fishing for uh, PGP uh, El Gamal keys. Uh, we took a public key server dump uh, that contained 800,000 uh, uh, El Gamal uh, public keys, and we started analyzing them. So we didn't know which libraries these keys were generated from, but by um, looking at uh, the properties of the primes and the generators within these keys, we could at least infer something, and in some cases, attribute them to some libraries, at least tentatively attribute them to some libraries. What we found is that among those keys, there are 40,000 keys which uh, do not match any of the key generation algorithms we found we could see in open source libraries. So these were generated by some software which we were not aware of. There's certainly some private, uh, some closed source implementation of OpenBGP, so they probably came from this. And among those 40,000 keys, 2,000 keys uh, were exposed to a practical plain test recovery attack uh, in the case where GPG, Boton, LibCrypto++, or indeed any other library which uses an optimization that, that we call short exponent and that I will explain. Uh, so whenever one of these libraries encrypts a message to one of these 2000 weak keys. So weak keys here is a misnomer. The keys are, are not weak in themselves. They're perfectly fine. And it's believable that if you use uh, the library that generated those keys, there would be no uh, security problem, hopefully. I mean, if the library was uh, made with some uh, sense. And also, for example, if you use Go to encrypt to those keys, there are no problems at all. However, if you use GPG, Boton, or Crypto++ to encrypt to those keys, then there is a practical plain test recovery attack. Um, so we call these cross-configuration attacks because they really stem from different configuration choices that were made for El Gamal in different libraries. Finally, the last result of our uh, paper is uh, a side-channel analysis of the same open source library, GPG, uh, Go, and uh, uh, LibCrypto++. We did not really look into both and for side-channels, but um, uh, um, for most of these libraries, this was mostly an exercise because neither Go nor LibCrypto++ claim to be side-channel resistant, so it's not a surprise that we found side-channels in them and neither button does claim to be side channel resistant. However, GPG claims to be. And nevertheless, we found a side channel condition which leads to a secret key recovery uh, in, in the El Gamal secret key recovery um, in some very rare cases. Um, so this is not a realistic attack, uh, to be honest. Uh, 
because the, the chances that the attack can be completed in a reasonable time are really um, um, negligibly low. However, um, in a cross-configuration scenario where um, you imagine that uh, GPG using a secret key that was generated by a different library, for example, a, a key that was generated by LibreCrypto++, then these side channel attacks become more feasible uh, to the point where a well-researched attacker could uh, break them. Uh, we estimate the cost of attack to some $100,000 uh, um, using resources available today if I remember correctly. Um, so this is the one slide summary of our results. Um, and uh, in a sense, I could stop here, uh, but of course I have more time. And now for the rest of the talk, I will go more into the details of how these attacks works, what enables these attacks. Um, I suppose mostly for the intellectual curiosity of seeing the mathematics behind this. Um, so this is really the only mathematical uh, thing I need you to, uh, to understand, uh, I need you to, uh, to remember. Uh, and it's essentially the, the application of the polyg hellman algorithm to uh, solving discrete logarithms. So I haven't really yet described really how LGMAL encryption uh, works. Uh, this will come, don't worry. I will just recall again what an LGMAL uh, ciphertext looks like. Uh, but you probably know that LGMAL is based on the difficulty of the discrete logarithm problem at least in theory, well, at least informally, um, there is no um, uh, proven reduction to the DLP problem, but uh, breaking DLP is the best way we know to, uh, to break LGMA. And so just for uh, memory, what's the, um, the DLP problem in this context? Um, the, exponential, uh, the exponentiation function is I have a fixed, uh, oops, uh, I have a typo here. This should be exp uh, alpha, not exp g. Um, so the exponentiation function to base alpha is I take uh, x and I map it to alpha power x modulo p. Um, the, the discrete logarithm problem is the problem of inverting this function. So I have alpha power x, I know alpha, and I want to compute uh, x. Um, so this is the discrete logarithm problem. And of course, this is a very important problem, which has many different kinds of instantiation. You have also the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem, which is important for elliptic curve cryptography. In this instance, we are uh, in the finite field uh, discrete logarithm problem. So it's integers modulo p. Uh, and so this is really a problem about the sub, the, the group of multiplicative integers mod p, the group of invertible integers. Um, this is something that we usually denote by z uh, underscore p star. Uh, so that's all the integers modulo p except to zero, which is not uh, an invertible element, of course. Um, and now one very old, very classical technique to break discrete logarithm in, uh, in some cases is to apply the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, and this goes under the name of the polyg hellman algorithm when we're talking about uh, breaking discrete logarithms. Um, so this is based on the decomposition of the multiplicative group of z mod p into a product of cyclic groups. Um, so this is a very generic technique, and this is also the, the reason why we need there to be one large prime factor within P minus one. Because if P minus one factors as two, of course, there will always be two in the factorization of P minus one, because P is going to be odd, times a sequence of prime factors, call them Q1, Q2, et cetera, up to QR, uh, then to each of these prime factors, we correspond a, a distinct cyclic group. I denote the cyclic groups by C uh, index uh, their, their order. So the cyclic group, uh, the, 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 the group of invertible level elements mod P is isomorphic to the cyclic group with P minus one elements. Uh, so it's just uh, a generator alpha to all the powers from uh, zero to P minus two. Um, but you can decompose this group as a product of groups and each of these groups has going to have order equal to one of the factors of P minus one. Um, the poly algorithm reduces the, the, the discrete logarithm problem in the group on the left, in the group of uh, invertible integers modulo P to discrete logarithm problems into each of these uh, Siglitz subgroups uh, into C2, CQ1, CQ2, et cetera. Um, so since these groups are going to be smaller, these uh, discrete logarithm problems are going to be easier. 
So instead of solving one big discrete logarithm problem of order p minus one, you are going to solve many small discrete logarithm problems of orders two, q minus, uh, q1, q2, etc. cetera. Um, and so the difficulty of solving all the, your discrete logarithm problem is of course going to be equal to the difficulty of solving the discrete logarithm problem in the largest of these groups. Um, and how difficult it is, this discrete logarithm problem, generically, it will be, uh, it will cost a square root of the size of the group. Uh, so if QR is the largest of these groups, for example, I expect to need to do a square root of QR operations in order to solve the hardest of the discrete logarithm problems. And then of course I need to do all the others, but there's not many of them. So in the end, the complexity will be dominated by the largest factor within P minus one. So if I want to have a secure discrete logarithm problem, I need to ensure that there is a large factor within P minus one. And I will call this factor Q, okay? So just to make things very concrete, uh, this is an overview of what the usual goals are for uh, security as stated by the FIPS 186.2 uh, specification, which is, I remind you, the specification of the DSA algorithm. Um, you can see that there is a big gap between the size, the recommended size for P and the recommended size for the largest prime uh, factor of P minus one, which we call Q. The reason is that, of course, you have this polyg hellman attack, but you also have other kind of attacks which ignore the largest factors, which work globally on Z, uh, on Z mod P, uh, which are called the number field sieve in this case, and which have sub-exponential complexity with respect to the size of P, instead of being with respect to the size of the largest prime factor Q. Um, so you can see that as security increases, the size of Q is going to increase linearly with security. It's just twice the security, essentially. Whereas uh, the size of P is going to increase super linearly. So we get to very large P's if we want to have large security. This is also one reason why Elgamal is not very popular and generally finite field discrete logarithm cryptography is not very popular uh, because you can get much better parameters with elliptic curves. We can have everything that scales linearly with the, with the security. So it's much easier to ensure higher level of security. Um, so this gap is going to be important because you see there's a lot of wiggle room between P, which has say 2048 bits and the size of, the larger, of its larger factor, which must be at least 200 to, to 224 bits. Of course, it could be more if you like. So you have lots of uh, space to play. And so what are the usual ways to play with this that you can see in the literature? So recall, the, our goal is to generate a prime P, which has at least one large prime factor Q, dividing P minus one. And the size of Q will be defined by the security level we are aiming for. The first choice, the most popular choice now, nowadays would be safe primes. These are primes of the form two times Q plus one. So Q is much larger than strictly needed, but at least you don't have to think too much about how you generate P. It says you first generate Q, you take a prime generation algorithm, you generate Q, you multiply by two, you add one, and you hope that this is prime. If it is not, you start again. Now, as you can see, this is fairly expensive because you need to try many different primes for this. So this was considered rather expensive back in the 90s. And this is the reason, for example, why uh, GPG did not choose this kind of uh, algorithm. GPG chose a different algorithm, which we call uh, Lim Li prime generation, which instead of guaranteeing that uh, there is one, a single large prime factor, it makes P so that it is equal to two times Q1, Q2, QR, well, all of Q1, Q2, et cetera, are all large. Um, now, this is a fairly original choice. As far as we know, only GPG made this choice. Um, it is cheaper than generating safe primes. So it made sense at the time back in the 90s when uh, the, the code was written. Um, nowadays, it would seem unnecessarily complicated. Um, you would just go for safe prime generation, which is the choice made, for example, by Liquido plus plus, and I believe also by Bolton. Um, but another advantage of Lim Li primes it, 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 is that it protects against some attacks, which I'm going to describe next. So Lim Li primes are an interesting choice where you cannot afford the cost of a safe prime, I would say. Um, which again, I insist nowadays, uh, it's not a realistic scenario. You can always afford same pr safe primes nowadays. Um, a different choice, which is influenced by the FIPS standard defined the DSA and which first appeared, I guess, in the Schnorr's uh, signature paper, 
um, and so we shall call it Schnorr primes, is to take P equal to two times Q times some cofactor F plus one, where this F can be just anything. So it could have small factors. We don't care. Uh, so one easy way to generate this by, is by using the FIPS 186 2 uh, prime generation uh, uh, algorithm, which essentially consists in first generating Q, then multiplying by Q, then trying all possible cofactors F of the appropriate size uh, to get a prime of the, of the prime we are, we are seeking. So this is definitely the cheapest way to generate uh, discrete log if primes. Um, it will lead to some attacks, as we will see, uh, if you don't do things properly. Another choice that maybe some libraries do, we haven't seen this, hopefully no one does it, but you can just take random primes. Um, if you take a random prime of uh, 2048 bits, the chances that it has a small factor of less than 200 bits uh, a large, sorry, a largest factor less than 200 bits are negligibly small. So you should be safe anyway, but you won't know it and you will not know what the factors of your prime are. So this is a really, really bad choice. Uh, just don't do it. Well, and then there may be other choices. In some sense, your imagination is the only limitation. Um, and actually we saw libraries do, well, we didn't see libraries, but we saw public keys that were generated by none of these algorithms. Um, it was like, we had evidence that some other algorithm must have been used and we can guess what the algorithms were. We don't know who made these choices. Um, these are arguable. In some, sense, in some cases, they may make sense, but um, they're at least arguable. Like if I was designing today El Gamal, well, first of all, I, would, I wouldn't design El Gamal, but if I was, I would go for safe primes, of course. Um, and now let's get back to, um, uh, to this uh, poly Gelman technique and let's see where the problem can really appear. Uh, now let's uh, again, look at P minus one equals two times Q1, Q2, et cetera. You have this Chinese remainder technique, which uh, decomposes the discrete logarithm problem into many different discrete logarithm problems. Uh, but some libraries uh, do one more optimization. Uh, instead of raising uh, alpha to the power x, where x is included be is between zero and p minus one, they will raise alpha to the power x, where x is between zero and some bound, which is much lower than p minus one. If the bound is large enough, this can be safe in some contexts. However, there is one case where it is well known since the 90s that it is, it is, not, safe. It is not safe. And this was already shown by Van Orschot and Vina. Um, suppose that alpha generates the full uh, group of uh, integers mod p, multiple, um, of uh, invertible integers mod p. And suppose that you know that the logarithm of x is smaller than, say, uh, the sum of the logarithms of the first three factors, q1, q2, q3. Then you have no need to solve all the other discrete logarithms. You can ignore q4, q5, up to q, uh, qr. You only need to solve the discrete logarithms or inside the cyclic groups of order Q1, Q2, and Q3. Each of these discrete, discrete logarithms will give you a modular condition on X. From each of these, you will learn X modulo Q1, then X modulo Q2, then X modulo Q3, and then you can just use the Chinese remainder theorem to reconstruct X. Since you know that X was smaller than some bound, uh, which is smaller than log Q2 plus log Q, log Q2, Q1 plus log Q2 plus log Q3, then you will know that there is a unique solution for X. Actually, this generalizes even more. You don't even need to be X to be within some bounds. You just need X to have a certain number of unknown bits, which is smaller than log Q1 plus log Q2 plus log Q3. Uh, so this is very flexible. You can even use it against side channel, uh, against implementation that through a side channel leaks some of the bits of X, but not all of them. Um, so this is a very useful technique, and this is really where we start seeing the problem. If we assume that some library has short exponent x smaller than some bound, let's say it's smaller than log q1 plus log q2 plus log q3. And if q1, q2, and q3 are small enough that I can solve discrete logarithms in these three groups, then I can break discrete logarithm because I can ignore, I can totally ignore the discrete logarithms in the larger groups. So I, even if there is a large prime factor within P minus one, I can just ignore that large prime factor and I, go, and I can go solving the discrete logarithm problems into the smaller subgroups Q1 to Q3. 
From this, I can recover fully my short exponent. So I must be really careful when I do this. And Van Oshot and Wiener already pointed out this problem back in 96, saying, if you implement Algama like this, if you use the short exponent optimization, if you use short secret keys and uh, primes such that P minus one has small factors, enough small factors, and where you're using a generator which generates the full uh, cyclic, the full uh, group of intervertible elements mod P, then you have a problem. Then you can break discrete logarithm in uh, uh, maybe very efficiently or maybe at least lower the security of your problem. So you must be really careful when you do this. And now let's talk about this group generator because this is really important. This is really what enables the attack. Uh, for this attack to be uh, to work, it's important that alpha is a primitive element. So I already mentioned this. Uh, so let's really uh, be totally explicit and let's say what we mean by primitive element. In element alpha, an invertible integer mod p is a primitive element if it generates the whole group of integers mod p, except zero, of course, which means that every element beta can be written uniquely as alpha power x for some x between zero and p minus one, uh, one of the two extremes excluded. Um, so this is the sense of a primitive element, or this can also be called the multiplicative generator of the full group of integers mod p. Um, but since this group is not of prime order, it contains many smaller uh, subgroups. And instead of choosing such a primitive element, alpha could be chosen differently. It could be chosen as a generator of the subgroup G of prime order Q. So if this Q is the large prime we chose, then we could just want to restrict to this subgroup G. Um, so an element alpha is said to be a generator of this subgroup if it satisfy if it is not zero nor one, of course, and if it satisfies the property alpha power Q equal to one. Uh, now, this is a choice that a cryptographer would tell you, this is the natural choice, because if you look at all security proofs that have been done for uh, discrete logarithms, they've always been done assuming that the order of the discrete logarithm group is prime. And so you need to restrict to this prime order subgroup inside Z mod P. Um, however, as you saw, uh, this was not stated as such, neither uh, in the El Gamal original paper, nor in the handbook of the Lytic curve cryptography. And so it's a common, uh, I would not call it mistake, but it's a common suboptimal sub choice to use a primitive element instead of a generator of the, of the prime order subgroup. Um, so um, prime modern practice definitely would say choose a generator of the prime order subgroup. So for example, if your prime is a safe prime uh, of the form two times Q plus one, then the only thing you need to do uh, is to take a square within this group. So four is always going to be a generator of the subgroup of order four, uh, of order Q, sorry. Um, so this is a very simple way to, uh, to, to choose such a generator. As a bonus, if you do this, uh, you are protected against the attack I just mentioned because this Chinese remainder Polig-Hellman technique will not work because your alpha is already restricted to only one of these groups and it will be restricted to the right one, the one which is largest. So you cannot solve discrete logarithm in this group. For all the other groups, the Chinese remainder technique will just give you trivial information. So you will learn nothing about the bits of X. So this is really a good way to protect against this kind of... Uh, reduction to other subgroups attacks, um, which protects against polygalman, but also protects against uh, other kind of attacks such as invalid subgroup attacks, which is a very classic technique uh, to attack uh, discrete log uh, crypto systems. And now finally, finally, I'm going to define how Elgamal works. What's really Elgamal? So let's recall, we have a prime P with all this uh, knowledge about how this should be generated. We have alpha mod P, which is a generator of something, either the prime order subgroup or of the full uh, invertible group of elements. Then we have a public key, which is alpha power X. Um, we shall call this capital X. Uh, and small x, of course, is the secret key. And now let's say I have a message M. What I'm going to do to encrypt this message M to the public key capital X? Well, I'm going to select an ephemeral key Y uh, at random. Uh, now, I'm sorry I'm being inconsistent with the notation I used before, which was taken from the handbook of uh, Lytic Curve Cryptography, where I wrote K for Y and A for X. I definitely prefer X and Y. I think it's uh, easier to keep track of this. Um, so I apologize if this is confusing. 
Now, what do you do? To encrypt, you just create a tuple which contains two elements. One is something that is very similar to a public key, and that's why we call it an ephemeral key. We take alpha, the same generator, and we raise it to the power y. We call this capital Y. Then what we do is that we take x, capital X, the public key, and we raise it to our secret ephemeral key, small y. This is going to be a share key in a sense. This is going to play the same role as the share key plays in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And now what we do is that mul we multiply the message, which we assume we have uh, encoded as an element of the, of the finite field. We encode the message uh, by, we encrypt the message by multiplying by this share key X capital Y. And now to decrypt, what we do is simply that we take this tuple, this uh, tuple we get from the encryption, we take capital Y, we raise it to the secret key small X, and then we divide uh, the second part of the ciphertext, x power y times m, by y power x. Because x power y is equal to alpha power x times y, um, this will be equal to capital Y power x. So these two terms cancel, and I'm left with m. And so I'm done with the creature. <clears throat> now let's rec uh, recall again what are the possible choices for p, the generator. Uh, Etc. So again, I have a typo. G should be alpha. So p minus one can be a safe prime, uh, two times q. Can be a Schnorr type prime, two times q times some cofactor f. Can be a Limli prime, two times q one times q two times q three, where all q's are large. Um, alpha, not G. Alpha uh, can be either a generator of the full group of invertible elements, or it can be a generator of the subgroup of order q. Uh, there's other possibility, of course. You, you could take anything in between. And to be honest, we have observed everything in between, uh, just not in the libraries we analyze. But in the wild, we, see, we saw this. And then there are the two exponents, the secret key x and the ephemeral key y. And these both can be taken between 1 and p minus 1, or they can be taken short, for example. Some libraries do take them short. And so really, to analyze security, you need to take care, you need to take into account all of these combinations and how they interact together. So first interaction, this is the Van Orschok wiener interaction. If the public key is, uh, say, of Schnorr type, so there is a cofactor F which contains many small cofactors, and in these small cofactors, there is a chance you, you can solve discrete logarithm. Then the generator alpha generates all of the multiplicative group, so that by using polygelman, you can reduce the discrete logarithm in all of these small groups. And finally, the secret key x is short. Then you have a key recovery algorithm. That's very straightforward. You apply polygelman, you reduce to discrete logarithms into only the small subgroups. You solve there, you apply Chinese remainder, you recover x. Done. Second way to play bingo on this card is to uh, instead of having a short x, is to have a short ephemeral key y. Then the same kind of uh, technique will work. Uh, but this time, it's not going to be a key recovery attack. It's going to be a message recovery attack. Because here, instead of finding the x, you will find the y. So we'll, you will find the ephemeral secret that was, used, that was used to generate the ciphertext. So what you can do then is that you can just, knowing small y, you can recompute capital Y and then you can, uh, sorry, you can recompute x power y, and then you can uh, use this to recover the message. So this is the attack that we present in our work, essentially. This is the combination of uh, Schnorr-like uh, keys, uh, Schnorr-like primes, sorry, uh, generators that generate the whole group of invertible elements mod p, and short exponents in the encryption routine. And now the question is, does this ever happen? Um, are there libraries where this is the case? Uh, for Gcrypt, uh, Gcrypt is the C library that's behind GPG. For Gcrypt, this does not happen. Uh, Gcrypt uses Limli primes. Um, so um, the fact that all the factors of P minus one are large, except two, of course. So this factor of two leaks one bit, but that's only one bit of leakage on the whole uh, secret. So you cannot use it to, to recover uh, the, the cipher. But none of the other factors will leak because it's too hard to solve discrete logarithm in any of the Q2, Q2, Q3, etc. cofactors of the large prime factor. Uh, 
So you are safe because of this strange choice that uh, GPG made. I mean, it's not so strange. GPG made this, uh, this choice exactly to protect against the Van Orschot Wiener attack. So it's, uh, it's not so surprising. And so GPG is consistent in choosing to use short exponents because this is safe in combination with their choice of using lean lean primes. Liprito plus plus uses safe primes uh, and uh, being consistent with the choice of safe primes uses a generator that generates only the subgroup of order Q, not the full subgroup. So GPG, uh, sorry, Liprito plus plus is in a sense twice protected against the poly attack because it's using safe primes and because anyway, uh, alpha generates only the, the, the subgroup of order Q. So it can safely use short exponents, no problem with that. Um, Go, well, Go has no key generation and it chooses large exponents, both for X and Y. So, uh, oh, sorry, no, not for X because it has no secret keys. So it only generates uh, ephemeral keys, but for ephemeral keys, it chooses large exponents. So Go has no problems at all. So you see, we haven't scored the bingo in any of these libraries. So these libraries can interact safely. I haven't put Botan here, but Botan is exactly like uh, Crypto++. Uh, so for any of these, it's fine. We have no problems. Uh, they can interact together. Uh, when Go sends a message to anyone, well, it's no problem because it doesn't use short exponents. When Crypto++ sends uh, messages to GPG, well, it's no problem because GPG uses Limli primes. When GPG sends messages to Crypto++, well, it's no problem again because uh, Crypto++ uses uh, safe primes and generators of the subgroup. So everything fine. But now the question is, is this the only possibilities? I mean, are there other libraries somewhere out there that use these keys which lead to uh, insecurities? Um, and now really take notice that the first three uh, things, P minus one, alpha and X, those things belong to the key generation algorithm. But the last thing, Y, belongs to the encryption algorithm. So it's totally possible that one library is doing the key generation. So the receiver library, the library that receives the emails is doing the key generation and a different library is doing the uh, encryption. Um, so um, now we're going to think what happens if a library that uses short exponents like Gcrypt or Crypto++ is encrypting to a library that uses primes which belong to the bingo one category. Uh, well, in this case, we have a breakage and this is exactly what uh, we found. Um, so here is just a summary of the same information with concrete numbers for security. I can skip safely this. I already said everything about this. There. Uh, but this is a table of what we found in our uh, key dump. So as I said, we analyzed 800,000 keys from a public key server. Um, so it, it was actually nearly 3 million keys of, all, of which only 800,000 were Elgamal keys and some fairly recent Elgamal keys. Of course, most of those are old, but since 2016, there are still people generating keys. And so what we observed is that you can really see everything. You can see uh, SIF primes, uh, you can see Limli primes, you can see Schnorr primes. Um, and among those, you can see all sorts of choices for the generator of the, of the group. In some cases, the generators generate the full uh, group. In some cases, they generate only the subgroup of prime order. Uh, in some other cases, we just cannot know because we cannot complete the factorization, so it's hard to tell. Uh, but sometimes we have evidence that it does not generate either, neither. It doesn't neither generate the full subgroup nor the subgroup of prime order. And so we have keys in all of these cases. And now the interesting cases are those keys in red, the Schnorr one type and the Schnorr three type, where we have a prime such that P minus one contains small factors and the generator that was chosen uh, contains, uh, well, uh, generates something more than just the, the, the subgroup of prime order. In those cases, we can mount our attack. Uh, and this is exactly what we did. And we confirmed, uh, we confirmed the attack in practice uh, with, with experiments. So just one word for closing, because I said we also did side channels. Um, now it, it would take quite some time to go through the side channel attacks. So I will just very quickly say that um, we found side channel conditions in all of the libraries. Um, this is not so surprising for most of them because they weren't claiming to be resistant. But the most interesting target was uh, LibCrypt. So what we did is that we, um, 
uh, use the threat model of a collocated attacker, an attacker that's sharing uh, a CPU, for example, with the, with a vulnerable application with a GPG um, a decryption uh, routine. And so we targeted the uh, exponentiation function in the decryption routine. Um, so we need to trigger several decryption in order to have enough side channel leakage. And the side channel leakage will come from uh, observing the time, the cache uh, reload timings. So we use different te te techniques, flash and reload, prime and probe. And what we get is some partial leakage on the uh, GPG uh, secret key. Uh, so this is now not message recovery. This is secret key recovery. We get some partial leakage. So we, we learn some of the bits of the secret key. And then what we need to do is that we need to complete the key recovery by using a um, baby step, giant step technique to solve the, the, the to fully solve the discrete logarithm. And so this turns out to be very hard to do if we are just targeting in GPG, just because the way that GPG chooses the exponents makes is uh, uh, like GPG chooses exponents that are large enough that are the work that is left to do after the leakage is still too much work to do in a reasonable amount of time, well, with a reasonable amount of resources. However, if now you go again in the uh, cross configuration scenario and you imagine that you have a secret key that was generated by Leap Crypto Plus Plus, for example, well, then Leap uh, Crypto Plus Plus generates secret keys that are even shorter than GPG. And then in that case, uh, we can recover the, uh, the secret with a feasible amount of, uh, of work. We verified this experimentally on some, uh, on some keys. Um, so these keys are very unlikely to appear. So probably no one is affected by our experimental verification, but we estimate that someone with more resources than what we threw at the problem, like a nation state actor, could reasonably break uh, this kind of uh, use, use case. Of course, this is a very complicated use case. It's not so realistic, but uh, it's a nice way to show how all this cross configuration plus lots of work around side channel can work together to make things uh, more insecure. And so this is all I wanted to say, and uh, just uh, for uh, uh, recall the conclusions of our work. Thank you very much for your attention and ready to take questions. Thank you, Luca. Uh, it's really an interesting talk and very clearly explained. Yeah, yes. and now we are waiting for uh, questions. Anyone want to ask a question, you can ask directly or you can uh, put your question in the chat. Okay, right. So Sia, do you want to ask directly? Sure, I can do that. Um, thanks for the talk, it was very, uh, <clears throat> very clear. Um, and that's uh, sort of um, allows me to ask the question because I think I understood everything. So awesome. Um, so basically, if I just want to, at a very high level, if I, if I want to sort of um, summarize uh, what you are saying is that attacks that you found possible um, are a um, sort of, uh, are because there are some entities who didn't generate their keys properly, right? And because they didn't generate their keys properly, this allows us to, or this allows an attacker to either um, recover their keys or their secret keys or recover a, a message encrypted to them, right? Um, I wouldn't say so. Actually, this is, this is a very important problem. Um, so of course this is open to debate, but the thing is, um, as I said uh, before um, here, like the, the problematic keys are the ones in red. Um, so these keys have nothing wrong per se. They are perfectly uh, fine. They're perfectly in line with what is written in the uh, in El Gamal's paper. They are perfectly in line with what is written in uh, the um, uh, handbook of elite curve cryptography. Special I see. Okay. One is exactly what is described there. So these keys 
in principle are not a problem. The problem is that the specification was not telling which keys, how you should generate keys. Sure. And now if per se these keys are not a problem, if you don't use short exponents, but of course, if you are the person generating these keys, now you must be sure that whoever encrypts to you will not use short exponents. Now, short exponents <laughs> is, a weird, is a weird thing because it's just an optimization. It's yeah. not something that's mathematically meaningful. Um, so you will never see it written somewhere, use short exponents. So naturally, you would not think of that scenario. But then when you see how people implement the things like GPG, you will realize that they use short exponents. And so now you have a problem of compatibility between these two. So I think in a sense, no one is at fault. And in a sense, everyone's at fault. I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, I guess this uh, goes back to when you were saying a weak keys is a misnomer. So yeah. there are not weak keys, they're actually keys. But the problem is that there is no RFC explaining explicitly how um, keys should be generated. We only have the original paper or, te or textbooks to go by. Okay, I understand. Okay, brilliant, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And then, uh, Anna, do you want to ask a question directly? Right, we have a question from Anna, and uh, he asked, uh, she asked. I, I couldn't uh, unmute myself in time. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, I was wondering, uh, since uh, the um, problem seems to stem to, from the fact that there is no standard, do you think uh, uh, the, the solution would be a standard? And is there any general view in the community that um, any will to uh, proceed towards the standard? which in itself takes quite a long time to um, process, but at least it would be a step in the right direction in your opinion. So um, I will first give my opinion and then what the opinion of the community is. I think they're pretty much in line anyway. Um, no, I don't think that we need an El Gamal standard. Uh, El Gamal is so 90s, uh, it should go away the same with uh, MC Hammer and uh, Disco. Um, like nowadays, uh, if you want to use discrete logarithm cryptography, you should use LT curves. So certainly not a old style algorithm. Um, and if you want to use LT curves, then we do have a couple of standards. We have uh, ECIES, um, uh, we have, uh, of course, ECDH, uh, which has been standardized more than once. Um, so all those standards are in place. Um, we don't need to have a, an Elgamal variant, a LT curve Elgamal variant. We don't need that standard. Um, so the right thing to do is to deprecate Elgamal from the standards that uh, consider it, that have it. Um, so there is somehow an urgent kind of urgent need to update the RFC 4880, uh, the open PGP RFC, to deprecate Elgamal. And uh, this is the second part. Uh, I know for a fact that people uh, agree that they want to deprecate them up. Um, the, next, the next version of RSC 4880 is in the works. And uh, the developers told me that, yeah, they were planning to deprecate El Gamal anyway. Of course, the problem with deprecation is that they cannot, they can deprecate uh, key generation, but they cannot uh, deprecate uh, encryption and decryption because they need to be backwards compatible. Um, so yeah, a safe choice seems to be, okay, let's deprecate key generation. Like let's do exactly like Go does. Let's deprecate key generation so that there is no more uh, a risk of generating Elgamal keys, which uh, are old, have many problems, etc. And let's just keep the encryption and decryption routines to be backwards compatible. And let's make sure that those use lo uh, long exponents and not short exponents so that we don't have these kind of problems. Thank you. That's uh, very informative. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, then I have two follow up questions. So the first thing is uh, El Gamo is uh, widely taught in uh, universities, cryptography uh, textbooks, right? So as an example of uh, discrete logarithm uh, based uh, encryption scheme. Do we need to remove that from, from textbook as well? <laughs> right? <laughs> I suppose not. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's so it's the simplest. Uh, yes. <laughs> public encryption scheme. Uh, you, you need to go through it if you want to 
to talk about discrete log and you cannot remove discrete log from textbooks. Of course, discrete log is too important. Yeah. So you, you need at least to show how you get a PKE from, uh, from Diffie-Hellman. So Elgamal is the most natural way. Now you could say, okay, let's use hashed Elgamal. Um, it's maybe slightly better choice than Elgamal. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, you need to go through it. Uh, like when you define uh, ECIES, the elliptic curve integrated mm -hmm. encryption standard, yeah. it's essentially Elgamal with more, uh, with a more complete specification that's in one single block, you have key transport and uh, the symmetric part, which is the standard way to do things. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe maybe just put Elgamal next to, uh, to hybrid encryption so that you know that, of course you shouldn't do things like this. You shouldn't encrypt a message. You should uh, rather transport a random key. So do key transport use a chem and then combine with a symmetric scheme. So maybe just better write those parts, but yeah, you cannot possibly imagine removing Algamal from textbooks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my, my second question is about removing key generation uh, from the software implementation. So if we do so, I would imagine some users, they might just use some random algorithm to generate the keys because they see they want to use, the, they think they, they want to use the Algamal. And then it might make things worse. Like those, those keys, you don't know how it's generated, might be generated by some random algorithm. They implement themselves, maybe. Well, yeah, this is always a difficult uh, question, how to handle the, the user. Um, the thing is, uh, there are so many users that are doing things we don't know just because they are not using the, the open source libraries. And like we have really no uh, way to, to know what they are doing anyway. So. Those users who are really stubborn, you cannot really do uh, do much for them. So the best you can do for them is to write in the open BGB standard, Elgamal key generation is deprecated, don't do it. If people insist on doing it, well, they will, uh, but uh, at least they will know that they shouldn't and then they, they do what they, they want to do. But to this day, uh, we still don't know what kind of library may have generated uh, the safe prime one case, for example. Like in this table, we, we don't know where those come from because uh, all the libraries we saw that use safe primes used uh, a generator of the small uh, subgroup. Uh, we don't know which library generated the lim li 2 case either. Um, so these are this is so few keys that maybe it's just a, an artifact of how we measure things, but who knows. Um, we don't know which libraries generated any of the NOR cases. So like it's, uh, we don't have the visibility on what the user can, may want to do. And if they want to do something, they will keep doing it. But uh, at least you must help them not shoot, shoot themselves in the foot. Okay, thank you. So uh, I have a very quick question. So um, uh, on one of your slides, you said uh, GPG was claimed to be uh, side channel resistant, right? So, and of course your work shows that there are side channels which are possible. And of course this can be amplified in a cross configuration setting like you showed. Yep. So uh, like uh, before your work, so how was this claim justified? Was it an informal claim like GPG is side channel resistant or was there some kind of a proof? Uh, certainly not a proof. Um, I, there may be written somewhere on the libgcrypt uh, readme notes that they are targeting side channel resistance. Um, not I'm not entirely sure that's written as a uh, strong guarantee, but one thing we know for sure is that in the past, GPG has always tried to uh, fix side channel attacks. So I they see. certainly have this goal. I see. And uh, when they say that, uh, you know, um, GPG like is side channel resistant, uh, were they being specific about the kind of side channels like, you know, cash, cash side channel that which you targeted or was it also covering timing leaks and so on? Uh, they are essentially yeah, targeting timing uh, leaks. Uh, they so are? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. They, they oh, are they targeting are? timing leaks. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, our okay, cash side, ch side channel is also a cash timing attack. So. Yeah, they, yeah. that's essentially what they are trying to do. They are trying to have a cost on time code. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, enc the encryption, the, the exponentiation routine in, Elga in Elgamal has explicitly, explicitly some uh, codes that do cost on time memory accesses and yeah, yeah, yeah. cost on time swaps uh, all to, to, to aim at the cost on time code. So this is essentially what they are trying to protect against timing side channels. I see, very interesting.
थैंक यू यू वेलकम